Hello, good morning. My name is Teresa Ribeiro and I'm, I have the pleasure to, to moderate this panel. Uh, I should start with Mr. Augusto Fragoso. And I'd like to ask you, even though Mr. Philip Costa and the Secretary of State have already talked about the competitive advantages, I would like to ask you, <coughs> as the regulatory body for communications, which are, for ANACOM, Portugal's major competitive advantages for cable landings and data centers in addition to its geography? Uh, thank you all. Thank you, especially for the organization. Um, we need as many events as this one uh, as we can uh, provide uh, to express what we feel uh, it's actually and truly a uh, real strategic position of Portugal in the, the worldwide competi uh, com competi uh, competitiveness and, uh, and connectivity uh, uh, framework. Well, uh, the Secretary of State actually already stated uh, uh, very broad uh, uh, set of aspects that are indeed uh, providing us a strategic uh, first role position. Uh, but I think there are a couple of others that we can state as well. Uh, remembering, for instance, that Portugal has been in the, last, uh, the latest years, and namely in the, uh, one of the latest uh, OCD um, uh, mark uh, comparison uh, element as the, most, the second most com competitive uh, and receptive to investment uh, countries in the world. Uh, we have uh, a rather uh, world-class talent market. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, very good uh, engineering schools. Uh, our uh, talents are actually not only uh, cheaper for foreign investment, but also very well trained. Uh, and we have a terrific uh, country uh, to bring uh, digital nomads, uh, to bring companies, and especially in this new context of remote working, uh, to have here hubs of uh, specific, uh, from specific industries uh, that can bring us uh, also a leading position in terms of offer to, uh, to foreign investors. Um, we have a vibrant tech community. Uh, we have also a good position in terms of green energy, but that is, was already stated by Philippe, and I'm sure ISAP is uh, the best uh, team here to <coughs> provide us more information about it. So I would say that uh, we have all the conditions to uh, to support uh, whoever wants to come here and invest in terms of uh, uh, data uh, industry. Uh, we also have in, in geostrategic terms uh, a condition that probably no other country is having. Uh, I, I would say that in terms of uh, economic exclusive, exclusive zone, I just saw recently uh, what uh, New Zealand is trying to do with the eighth new continent, the eighth continent with Zelandia, uh, as it's called. And basically what they are trying to do there is what we already have. So uh, we always say that Portugal is the sea. <laughs> uh, we use this expression a lot. But uh, the thing is, uh, if Portugal is the sea and we have all this capacity, then how can we cope and put these two facts uh, working together to bring our potential. Uh, I think that one of these days someone asked me, um, where do you see Portugal going in the next five years? And I, I said, well, I hope that it doesn't go anywhere. We are extremely well positioned here, not only geographically, but also in terms of all these capacities that are needed to be built uh, into a digital vibrant society. So in five years, I hope that we are exactly here, but with all these capacities explored, basically. Okay, thank you so much. Now, I'd like to ask Mr. José Manuel Marques from DGRM. Uh, in the most recent licensing of subsea cable landings, there were some hiccups. Can you let us know how the Portuguese authorities are setting up a fast line for a simplified licensing process and what progress can we expect and when? Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. 
Well, uh, I'm not José Carlos Simão. I'm in behalf of him. For, unfortunately for him, it was completely impossible to assist the meeting. So, uh, but in, on behalf of him and the GRM, I would express our gratitude to and the opportunity given to share with you some thoughts and some some words about this important this important issue. Well, the IPCAT, the tricky the tricky issues concerning the the laid off submarine cables. Uh, well, in what concerns the maritime space, Portugal, we have uh, a maritime special plan. Uh, and it is, uh, we, we were pioneer in, in this kind of instruments in the European Union and in the world as well. And uh, in our maritime special planning, we foresee, we figure out what will be the needs of the activities of the blue economy in what concerns the reserve of space. And we predicted and we, uh, and we established in our, uh, in our maritime special planning uh, spaces for the development of the activities of the blue economy. So we have spaces for agriculture, spaces for uh, renewables and so on. So, but in what concerns the submarine cables, we don't have any reserve of space. What we have in, in, in the opposite, it is uh, the areas in our maritime special, uh, special planning where it is impossible to establish uh, submarine cables in order to protect the, the marine ecosystems and the, the vulnerable marine ecosystems. So, <coughs> according to the bureaucracy that we have under the, our maritime special planning, it is easier for the GRM. Every pro, uh, uh, all the process, it is completely dematerialized, um, even in what concerns the geographical maps. And uh, we provide to all of, of the promoters all the information needs for the establishing of the, the activities, including the submarine cables. And in what concerns the maritime aspects and the, the issues under the, the, the Minister of the Sea, we will need something between six to eight months to issue a permit for submarine cables. We do not need more than six to eight months for that. So, but the tricky issues, as far as, as we understand, are not in the, in, the, in, the sea, in the sea context, but in the land context. So in the, in what I, uh, in the landing stations or landing spots for submarine cables. In that, in fact, we have some concerns on that and we are, complete, we are working hard with the environmental agency in order to establish the correct procedures for that and to avoid all the bureaucratic loops that we have to do, that the promoters have to do for, for landing the, the cables. Uh, nevertheless, <coughs> nevertheless, I think that in what concerns the GRM, 10 months, one year, uh, in one year, we, we even con con considering the, the bureaucratic issues for landing the cables, we, 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 we can give an answer for that. So, what we have to do here, it is to maybe to establish a new framework for the landing stations and maybe we need some kind of some adjust, adjustments on the legislation and uh, of course we are cooperating very hard with, uh, with Anacom and um, in, in order to see if he if you have, you can. If you, we can have some common platform. Sorry, it's an alarm. If we can have some common platforms, informatic platforms, in order to facilitate all the process. Well, Mr. Lacasta, <coughs> welcome to our panel. Um, I, I had a question for you about the times, but Mr. Jose Manuel Marx already answered, so <laughs> I'll ask you another thing. Uh, the subsea cables usually having a very limited environmental impact. It is now now withstanding compulsory for uh, to apply for HAPA pre-assessment. What are the biggest challenges facing both HAPA and the promoters in these pre-assessment processes, and how can be they overcome? Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. I think it's a very timely um, event we're having here, so as to 
really draw lessons from the experience we've already had in, in a few of these uh, underwater cable um, uh, docking uh, projects and, and looking forward. So if I may, and I will also pick up on, on some of the stuff which was mentioned before, the key, the most important first consideration I would make is the following. We're very mindful in this country, as the Secretary of State mentioned, that we can become uh, a hub, a data center hub, uh, uh, seen as is a prime location for that, as we all know, and also, uh, as part of that, uh, a docking area for subsea cables. So, we're, we're tracking that, we're working with different organizations, some of them participating in this event here, and that's the first note. We need to collaborate and continue collaborating with one another in order to, to uh, shepherd these ideas and projects. Um, secondly, of course, um, we, on, on the environmental side, we have essentially three regulatory angles, if I may say so. Number one is impact assessment, to figure out whether a particular project is to be subject or not to an impact assessment proper. Uh, this is called screening. You call it pre-assessment, the regulatory term is screening. We screen whether the project as presented should be subject to impact assessment or not. Second uh, situation, which also uh, turns out, and not so much in the cables, but on the data center front, for instance, is the, the issue of water availability. Because uh, these, these facilities need a lot of water to, to cool, and we're working very closely with promoters in, to in order to, to ensure that. And thirdly, of course, as mentioned also by the Secretary of State, the issue of green renewable energy upstream, because all these projects must be powered going forward, must be powered by green energy. So what are the lessons that we can already draw very quickly from the real life on the ground, so to speak, experiences? Number one lesson, I would say, and Zemanel has already mentioned, is updating our uh, uh, maritime planning instruments so as to start taking into account uh, uh, particularly underwater sea cables. That's number one. Uh, and, and I look forward to seeing those, those works done and we're all working together in that regard. Second, uh, what we did as a back office uh, document really between agencies when the project started popping out was we prepared, uh, as I said, a, a back office uh, a guidance document, which is extremely detailed in terms of the sort of information we, we would require proponents to put on the table. And our main lesson from that document is that it, of course, was useful, but number one, we need to turn that document into a public available document and with a, a checklist format, something very simple that people can, you know, uh, very quickly know what is it that they should be doing uh, going forward. Uh, another lesson which I think is relevant, this is, it's a, it's a good lesson, we've already learned it, is that we need to have these documents specifying the type of information which is required, because otherwise, given that this is a type of project which is not foreseen in the existing European and national impact assessment legislation, um, the default position early on was for everybody to ask as much information as they thought should be asked. And in, ironically, uh, early on, and this has been changed since, but early on, you could end up in a situation where for a screening uh, process in an area which was not specifically covered by impact assessment legislation, you would ask for more information than people would be uh, 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 requested to submit if they were subject to environment impact assessment problems. So we need to, to simplify that, and that's what we're focusing on going forward. Another area which I think is very important and was mentioned earlier as well, is we need to have a single contact point for promoters. I think DGRM is, DGRM is the, uh, the relevant entity, I think, that could do that job there. They have experience in terms of project management, for sure. Uh, they have an online uh, uh, permitting system which, which can do the work here. And as we heard earlier, and we fully support that as well, and uh, a web portal with all the information relevant for promoters, I think it's something which is very relevant and I think it's very important indeed that Anacom and DGRM are working in that regard. Uh, finally, um, I would say that a lesson which, uh, not so much a lesson, but certainly something which we could take advantage of is, is, is the following. A few years ago in this country, when we were doing some pilot projects on wave energy, 
we were able to set aside an area uh, on, on, on sea, and then again uh, with a docking area inland, uh, set aside an area, as I said, which had a pre-assessment, impact uh, environmental assessment of the conditions for, in this case, wave energy projects to be to be installed. We should probably do something similar here going forward, a, a, a kind of a corridor, a docking corridor, both in sea and in the docking area inland, to to pre-clear regulatory conditions. I think that would make uh, promoters' life a lot more easy. So I think with an initial uh, uh, statement, I would uh, sort of summarize what are the lessons. Perhaps I, I would add another one very quickly, which is the following. From our experience, and this is very important that we say, from our experience, these projects typically don't have uh, a, a, a potential or a significant environmental impact that warrants uh, a, an impact assessment proper. And that's why our screening in our screening processes uh, without exception, we've cleared these projects from environmental impact assessment. So that's number one. Number two, nonetheless, uh, we find typically that there might be two issues that need to be uh, uh, looked into in detail. Number one, uh, underwater cult cultural heritage uh, um, needs to obviously be, be documented and, uh, and handled. Um, and number two, on land, uh, the issue of the national eco ecological reserve needs to be also taken into account, of course. These would be my, my comments. Okay, thanks so much. Um, taking, taking the words of Mr. Nuno Lacasta, I would like to ask you, Mr. José Manuel Marques, in reducing the footprint as an energy and sweet water consumption, can company-owned sweet water intake and rejection facilities be used for the cooling of data centers here in Sinus? as in REN, uh, LNG tankage, and EDP coal fire power plant? Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. But um, in, in fact, the, the energy expended for the data centers are, are very high. And uh, we have a huge footprint, uh, ecological footprint, in, 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 in cooling those systems. We are aware of that. So uh, now we have, for instance, we, we have a project, a pilot project in what is called an uh, intelligent reef. And in the intelligent reef, we have um, a project or an idea to establish a submarine database center in order to avoid and the, the water of the sea cool the, 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 the data center. Uh, with or without the, your, the, the facilities that we have here in, in Sydney. So, so concerning the, the, the cooling systems, as far as I, under, I, as I understand, the cooling systems that we have here in Sydney use the, the, the marine water to refresh or to cool the, 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 the data centers. So it's very useful. And, and we have a huge opportunity when we are looking to the sea because the sea allows us to, to diminish our, our ecological footprint, of course. And uh, in, not only in what con uh, concerns the carbon storage, but using the, the temperature of the sea in order to, to avoid the, expand, the excessive expense of energy that we have for, for cooling those systems. I think so. It's a good, very good idea. Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Augusto Fragoso, will EU data protection standards be compromised if Europeans don't have absolute control over their own data? Well, that is, that's something that we have been discussing for a while, which is the question of sovereignty, not, not only of uh, Europe, but also from our own Portuguese uh, sovereignty, because uh, in, at the end we are Europeans, but we are also Portuguese. And basically, uh, <clears throat> regulation is something that we should understand uh, as a dynamic process that understands precisely what are the needs of the market to support our own strategy, our own uh, sovereignty, but also to support innovation. And we know that putting together innovation and regulation in the same sentence might be tricky. Uh, so every time I hear absolute control in any sentence, there are uh, a lot of bells ringing, like uh, what does that mean, absolute control? So uh, in regulatory terms, I would say that we need uh, 
the control that is necessary uh, to align with the European and the Portuguese strategy in one hand, in the other hand, enough to do this, but not uh, too much, so we constrain the innovation processes and the capacity that we, we de developed. What I think is the one that is now in place in terms of data, namely the data bordering and, and the, the measures that have been taken by the, the EU uh, strategy seem to be uh, uh, enough. So I think they are uh, what they should be. Uh, it's now a question how we translate that to our own specific strategy. Uh, and that, uh, that's what we are discussing here today, actually, is how can we create the connectivity support uh, to bring that... Uh, I would say that when we will have that as a huge problem in Portugal, we are, will be uh, very much okay. <laughs> that's the, the problem I, I want to have in, in, in two or three years. Uh, right now, uh, we consider that uh, what's stated, like I said, uh, is... Uh, enough uh, and uh, we just have to get uh, how to translate that to our initiatives, to our own uh, local strategies, uh, namely in terms of what we consider absolutely need, which is to promote uh, social and economical cohesion, integrating uh, the ultra peripheral regions and bringing uh, innovation and development not only to specific hubs, but have much more hubs than the ones we are thinking at this point, collaborating uh, inside our own borders. Uh, also in terms of data, I mean, uh, that's what uh, we are looking at right now. Okay. Not, now that we're talking about sovereignty, um, and the Portuguese and the, the European one, how do we increase the security of subsea cables crossing our ex exclusive economic zone? Well, our, our sea has something like 3.5 kilometers depth. So the major part of the, the submarine cables are under the 1,000 meters depth. So at that depth, uh, the security is very, very, very strong. Nevertheless, when we, when we arrive, not the EZ, but the territorial sea, in, in there we have some cases of security in what concerns the, 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 the infrastructure. And according to uh, our, uh, our, our uh, uh, issue process for, uh, for issue permits for the, for the blue economy activities, we have uh, not only the, sp the, the space for the activity uh, includes a security zone. So the, the, the security zone for the submarine cables are the security zone required by the promoter. So we do not impose the security zone. So if the, the promoter wishes to have, for instance, uh, five, five uh, under meters or one, one kilometer of security zone for the, the submarine cable, it is okay for us. The only thing that we have to take in consideration it is the compatibleness of the activities that we have mostly in the territorial sea and in that case there are some kind of fish activities that are not allowed. Uh, for instance, bottom trawling, it is not allowed when we have a submarine cable, of course. So uh, this is uh, the security for the infrastructure. So the security in what concerns the sovereignty. Well, uh, it's a critical and a crucial issue because we are, I have heard here that we are peripheral. We are peripheral in what concerns the European Union, but we are not peripheral in what concerns European, the Atlantic Ocean. So the submarine cables and network of submarine, submarine cables give to us the centra, uh, a central, a centrality uh, um, characteristics that we need very much. So, uh, of course, we have to protect those submarine cables, but uh, we have to have included the Navy and the other, uh, other organisms for that. So I don't know exactly when we ask me for the security, if you are asking for the security of the cable itself or the security aspects regarding the defense. Both. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, for the, for the infrastructure, uh, I think that the, the situation it is clear. We have we have a, a system that allows uh, allows as far as, as it is possible to have a security zone for the submarine cables, and the submarine cables are secure in in our sea. But of course, we have the, the a submarine cable. It is a strategic infrastructure in what concerns a lot of things, and we cannot. <laughs> defend the submarine cables by ourselves, uh, by ourselves, the GRM. We have to include the defense minister here. Okay. I'm glad that you talked about blue economy because I have a question for you about it. In the Portuguese blue economy, what services may be in place to support subsea cable landing, maintenance and operations? And what about vessel repairing? Vessel repairing? Well, uh, 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 as far as I understand and I know, as far as I know, uh, we have um, uh, repair facilities for all kind of of ships and navies in in, in our in, in our territory. So I don't I don't think that we have a problem in that. So the, the the repair we don't have a problem with the repair of the vessels of the ships. Of course, we have maybe we have to increase the capacity, the national capacity to have ships dedicated to the survey of the submarine cables. I mean, if, if we, have, we have to have to, to perform studies for the environment impact or for, every, for everything else, for, for assessing the, the geological aspects and so on, which are related with, with the submarine cables activities. And if we have uh, a strange uh, 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 third nation uh, ship coming to our waters, we should have uh, that company should have should, should have uh, uh, obtained um, the authorization for Minister of Foreign Affairs. So in that case, we can we can have our own ships, or at least to have Portuguese flag ships for doing that. And uh, doing that, we will spare a lot of time, and uh, we will spare a lot of month because we do not need any more a permit for the Foreign Affairs Minister. So uh, we have to take a, a, an eye on that and see if it is possible to have uh, Portuguese flagships for, for the surveying uh, needed by the, the, the submarine cable activities. Uh, I don't know if I asked, answered your question or not. Yes, thank yeah. you so much. Um, now, Mr. Nuno Lacasta, um, Continuing in the blue economy, both inshore and, and offshore, how will APA cope with the growing numbers of requests for settling up data centers in Portugal and what can be done to standardize and then speed up the licensing processes, even though you already given us some answers in the, in the prior question? Okay. Perhaps I can add a couple more, more uh, ideas here. Let me uh, first back up a little bit and reiterate something which was said earlier. Let's think about Sinj for a little while. Sinj is transforming itself as we speak. It's becoming, I just, I was jotting down several, you know, keywords for this, but it's pretty clear that Sinj is becoming a green, a blue, a circular and a digital economy hub. It is already a large industrial facility. It's already a main port. And it's of course, uh, already a main, uh, uh, both hydrocarbons and chemicals uh, industrial facility. But even these are converting themselves as we speak very quickly, because of course, everybody's moving towards accelerated decarbonization. The polymers industry is, is uh, metamorphing as we speak because it will have more recycled plastics to produce new polymers. Uh, obviously the uh, hydrocarbons as well with biofuels, etc., etc., etc. This is something that I would like to emphasize because it's the strategic vision, which was mentioned earlier by the member of government. It's the strategic vision which really needs to push us and to throttle us going forward in, in Sinus, for instance, but also in other areas of the country. Now, this means that from our perspective in the environmental area, we of course are tracking and our, our uh, central players in everything connected to decarbonization. A lot of our workload today is, for instance, on uh, uh, impact assessing and uh, uh, permitting uh, um, solar uh, power uh, stations. A lot of them are being built in the country 
uh, we're, we're talking of something in the vicinity of seven gigawatts that need to be installed, of solar alone that need to be installed uh, within this decade. And in fact, it may very well be three more gigawatts in addition to these seven, if we take into account also some hydrogen projects, such as the one in Sinj, I forgot to mention, uh, in, in, in the pipeline. So this is a very, very central uh, aspect, which is we need to fully move towards green energy to uh, power all these uh, projects. And that's the first note. Secondly, we obviously need to ensure that you know, red tape is cut to a minimum. And it should only be focusing on uh, ensuring that natural resources are fully protected. And the best way to doing that, of course, is to learning from lessons that we've uh, learned in the past, both in terms of underwater cables, as I mentioned earlier, and also wave energy. So th what we'll be doing over the next few months with, with partners in, is indeed, as we're doing it on other areas of decarbonization, is to issue uh, streamlined guidelines to, if need be, we will change legislation, uh, we will make it more objective, but crucially, and I'll end with this, it's sort of the way I started, we will keep with other partners sitting down with promoters so as to seeing in, specific, in a specific location and so as to really co-design the project with the promoters. Um, and I think our lesson from the past two years in scenes and, and other locations is that indeed promoters uh, do uh, request and benefit and so do we from that early interaction so as to making sure that essential things are put on the table and we clear you know that same table if something is not needed so that's the way we we're approaching this going forward thank you so much well i think that for finalize um Mr. August Fergus, if Europe's fourth industrial revolution is driven by artificial intelligence and 5G technology, can the EU afford to ignore the best technologies available globally, regardless of where they come from? Well, uh, the, the global answer would be no. Uh, we need all the capacity that uh, we can provide to support our innovative processes and especially uh, our competi uh, com competitiveness and, and, and uh, market approaches in, in European terms, in national terms. Uh, but obviously you cannot accept everything. I, I think that 5G is a very different subject from AI. <laughs> uh, and we can deal with those in, in very uh, different ways. In terms of 5G, we have uh, two main aspects. One is the technology in itself, the hardware, and where it's coming from. And basically, uh, the answer is very easy. If we don't trust where it's come from, either we produce our own and we create the capacity to produce the same kind of platforms to support what we believe in, or uh, if we don't have that capacity, we have to have the capacity to integrate uh, that technology, limit, uh, limiting the risks. Uh, to not to just to accept that just because it's coming from some place, uh, it's not secure or uh, it's not uh, having fulfilled all the regulation issues that we consider important to be fulfilled. But uh, we have to deeply analyze uh, its technological uh, uh, brought up uh, how the product itself and each product uh, is being put up and uh, limits uh, the risks that we are afraid of uh, in terms of the application of that specific uh, platform, that specific te technology. Uh, the worst that can happen is uh, understanding this in the, in, in the global uh, uh, aspect uh, that if we don't use technology more advanced than the one that we are able to produce, we end up uh, being uh, lagging uh, over the, the overall uh, advance uh, in terms of uh, economical and compet uh, competitiveness. So, um, uh, yes, we, are, we have our own sovereign uh, aspects uh, to be assured. Uh, we cannot accept uh, uh, the usage of uh, certain technologies in a way that uh, it would go against our 
own beliefs uh, in democracy and, and, and security, etc. Et but I really think that sometimes we, some of these uh, limitations are more political than uh, and led by uh, very specific interests than real technological issues. So we should be able to separate those two. Uh, in AI, it's a little bit different, other than the, the computational capacity that we have to build in to support the AI development. Uh, AI in itself is something that has been worrying us each time more, and also the, union, uh, the European Union. And that's why uh, the European Union has just set uh, a regulation orientation for AI, uh, which is, again, in my understanding, uh, very adequate. So uh, it doesn't limit uh, uh, the orientation for innovation. I just said three different levels of uh, AI approach that should be, uh, should be in regulatory terms, also having different uh, remedies and different uh, ways to, to, deal with it, uh, to deal with it upfront. Uh, basically, uh, uh, there is a level, the third level, uh, uh, that is considered the AI that should be uh, regulated very closely uh, due to the processes that uh, it can uh, produce in terms of, of market uh, introduction, in terms of behaviors, market and consumers' behavior. Uh, and those, as stated, should be uh, watched very closely. But right now, AI, uh, European Union, and I think we should follow <laughs> that lead, uh, Basically, we have to. But, uh, but what states is uh, innovate, uh, be careful, uh, but uh, we don't want to, to put up initial barriers uh, to development and innovation there. Uh, obviously, that when we talk about AI and we talk about connectivity and the data center strategy, uh, we have to think that these capacities are also the ones being used to promote uh, Portuguese comp uh, competitiveness in terms of the usage of all the data that we can set up in Portugal. Uh, and I cannot stop thinking, we talk about uh, blue economy, uh, that actually we should, with all these conditions we are stating, we should be able to state a, a Portuguese digital brand. We should be able to express uh, how uh, well prepared we are and how good are our conditions uh, to integrate in our country this capacity to produce new products and new uh, technological capacities and services uh, that actually are questioning about where they are coming from, then they should be coming from here. Uh, and we have the problem uh, solved. But in a certain way, uh, uh, all these strategies, uh, sectoral strategies, are have, uh, they, they really need to be converging uh, to something that we are all saying that is strategical. Uh, and I cannot stop thinking about the CAM, uh, the, 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 the CAM ring and the connection that being, has been lagging uh, for implementation and doesn't permit, for instance, Açores and Madeira uh, to have the proper conditions to develop their innovation centers, innovation hubs, with edge computing, I don't say that in Madeira or Azores we can build uh, one of the biggest data centers like uh, has been being produced here, but for sure we can produce there uh, digital hubs uh, specialized in blue economy. Uh, we have all the conditions to do that, and we are a couple of milliseconds away. Also to provide from those locations services to uh, all the other continents and, and and to develop this thing that we call blue economy. Blue economy is blue science. That's why Portugal is being uh, stated as a state of the art in terms of, uh, of uh, censoring of submarine cables. Uh, but we are, if we don't implement it, since we, we came with uh, uh, the initial capacity, uh, some of the initial ideas, and we have actually put up uh, in scientific terms and in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, implementation capacity, uh, the real capacity to do, to do it, and that is uh, being foreseen and is uh, in, the, in the tender that uh, 
uh, is at the moment uh, in progress to do that, the, the question is, why don't we do it? If it's strategic, it must be upfront, it should be happening right now because we are losing that window. As we are losing the window of the investments that are, need to be done in, the, in terms of um, European connectivity, uh, rethinking uh, the, the English hub uh, after Brexit. Uh, all, those, all that capacity uh, is being rethinked and reconsidered in terms of European Union uh, and actually in, in terms of world connectivity. And we, we have a very small window to propose uh, Portugal as the only uh, viable or best viable possibility uh, to integrate that capacity that has to uh, go somewhere uh, into Europe uh, through Portugal. Uh, so, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, that uh, when we think about AI or uh, 5G, we have to think it in terms of overall, uh, overall uh, connectivity, also about inland connectivity. We are doing that effort. Uh, Anacom, as probably you have seen, has launched uh, a new uh, map of uh, white areas uh, and basically, we have this very precise notion that we have a very good inland capacity that is not being uh, expressed. So, I would say that we, with this platform for uh, uh, the one shop uh, stop platform for uh, submarine cables, we have also to express our natural uh, connectivity capacity connecting uh, subsea cables and uh, inland capacity. And we have to express this digital Portugal brand in a way that actually uh, doesn't give any doubt to anyone. Uh, if uh, I'm an investor outside and I'm looking uh, at Portugal as a probable place where I would like to put my services, my business, or my next connection, if I'm a network uh, analyst that is in the hyperscalers that is considering where should I now in Europe uh, land my next cable, uh, Portugal should be uh, the first answer that they would, the, the, they would consider. And, and means that we need to not only this one -stop shop platform, but we need to have uh, a strategic digital platform that shows all this together uh, align in one strategy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fergus, Mr. Max, and Mr. Lacasta. It was a pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, I hope you enjoyed.